There are 81 mascots in NCAA football, and today I'm going to put them all into Imperialism where only one team will be standing by the end of the video. If you've never seen Imperialism before, this wheel decides which college will be attacking, and the directional wheel decides which way they're going to go. So for this example, Vanderbilt is attacking Western Kentucky, and if they win, they'll take all of the Hilltoppers' land, but if they lose, all of their territory will be taken and they'll be eliminated. With a couple minutes remaining, Western Kentucky has the ball, and they're up by 7, so if they can pick up this 3rd and 12, they're going to seal their win, and that's what they do. The Hilltoppers defended their home territory successfully, and even though the teams were completely even, Vanderbilt still can't do good. In mascot mashup, all 81 colleges are 99 overalls, so anybody could win it all, and I think that's going to make things incredibly interesting. Oklahoma State's the next team attacking as they just got landed on, and the arrow is just going to run into the tip of Oklahoma's land, so we're getting one final bedlam game, and with 42 seconds remaining, the Cowboys are on pace to win just like they did in real life. Oklahoma's thrown up a prayer though, and it's intercepted. The Sooners just didn't have the height that they needed to to make a play on this ball, and I have no clue who's going to come out on top of this entire imperialism. It could be any one of these 79 remaining colleges, and if your team's not on the map, it's because they weren't included in NCAA Football 14. I don't know why there's so many missing mascots, but it is an outdated game, and Rutgers is attacking Penn State in our next matchup. This is a battle between Knights and Lions, and Rutgers has a tad bit of a height advantage, so we'll see if they're able to use that successfully. With about a minute and a half left, they're down by four, but the scoreboard's glitched out right now, and this one's going to the house. So the Nittany Lions find themselves down by three at home trying to defend their territory. So we'll see what happens. We are set up for a very close ending. And on third and two, they are going with a pass, but their quarterback tries to run it. And the Knights were all over it to force this fourth and five where there is a drag open underneath, but they're going for something else and it's intercepted. I don't know what the Nittany Lions saw here, but the Rutgers linebacker was all over it. And imperialism just started, but we've already seen multiple big programs get eliminated. I like that every team's a 99 overall because it's going to lead to even more chaos, and the Badgers are next up with this wheel taking them to Michigan. There's only two teams in the state, and they've been pointed in the direction of the Spartans, so we have another animal versus human clash, and it's also gonna come down to the wire. Believe it or not, at one point in this game, Michigan State was up 21-0, but they've given up 25 straight, and the Badgers' defense hasn't given up any points in the second half, and they just forced a fumble. That's gonna make it 4th and 14, so if the Spartans don't pick this up, they're eliminated, the ball is up in the air, and it is just swatted down. So Wisconsin is gonna win on the road, and it's really weird to see all of Michigan covered in a sea of red. The only college remaining in the state is Western Michigan, and I'm trying to remember what their mascot is, but I can't figure it out. I know it's something weird, and I'm sure we'll see it later in this video, but I didn't think it would be this soon as Toledo's attacking them. This game is the Rockets versus the Broncos, and Western Michigan has it down by three, but they're also on their own three-yard line, so it's going to be very difficult for them to go down the field in 50 seconds, and Toledo just sent an amazing blitz. That safety will seal their win, and their attack on the road was successful. All of Michigan already belongs to outsider teams, and we're only five rounds into imperialism. Next up is going to be the Bearcats, and let's see what direction they'll be headed as this arrow goes to the west. It's going to be Cincinnati versus Purdue, and we'll see what Purdue Pete can do. It seems like he's going to get his team in the lead with a few minutes left, but the Bearcats just sent an amazing blitz, forcing a third and goal, and they forced the ball out. It wasn't ruled as a fumble, but now the Boilermakers have no choice but to go for it on fourth down, and they don't pick it up. That means if they don't force a defensive stop on the Bearcats, they're not going to get the ball back, and that truck was massive, but he doesn't make it. So Purdue was gifted another opportunity, but they haven't done the most with it. They have no timeouts left at this point, and they keep getting hit and bound, so the clock is really run down, but they've at least put themselves in a position where they could launch up a few Hail Marys, and that would give them the lead, but they're very lucky that the Bearcats forced them to drop that ball, and there's the deep shot we were expecting, as it's going to go all the way to the house. The Bearcats just let the Boilermakers do that to them, and unless Cincinnati can pull off a miracle, they have choked in the end, which is really disappointing. They had the win in their hands, but they just couldn't play good defense. They're taking one final shot down the field, and it's intercepted by the Boilermakers. So Purdue successfully defended their home territory, and Cincinnati has officially been eliminated. I'm loving how this is going so far, because every single game is so close, and the college wheel barely just landed on UCF down in Florida, who's headed south to take on the Hurricanes. If you're wondering what a hurricane might look like, it's just Sebastian, and we'll see if another team of Knights can have success as Rutgers already took down Penn State and the Hurricanes defense is going to need to step up because they only have a three-point lead. So we will see what happens in this final 77 seconds and what is he doing? All of the Sebastians are celebrating that big sack and UCF is really punting in this situation. They have all three of their timeouts so their goal is to force a three and out and we just watched Cincinnati fail in this same situation. So if Miami doesn't pick up this third and eight, you can't count the Knights out just yet. They have 35 seconds to go down the field and score 
score at least a field goal, but having no timeouts could hurt them. And let's see what they draw up on this third and four. It looked like four verticals. They go deep and it's knocked away. And even though Sebastian has real hands, he just struggled to hold on to the ball. It all comes down to this fourth and four and they're immediately going underneath to get the first, but they're taking forever to spike the ball. And I'm not sure what the Knights range is when it comes to attempting a field goal, but with that tackle and bounce, the game is over because UCF simply couldn't get a snap off. With that result, Miami's taking over a pretty decent portion in the state of Florida, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not that much territory. And there's so many unclaimed states across the entire US, but a team like Wake Forest has no chance at getting any of them because there are so many colleges surrounding them. Next up, the Demon Deacons are attacking Tennessee and they're trailing by seven with a minute and a half remaining, but they have the ball so they could tie it up. I'm not sure why Tennessee's mascot is Smokey, which is a dog because they are the volunteers, but I'm also getting a refresh on every team's mascot in NCAA football. So that's been fun with this video. Wake Forest just picked up that first down. So they've kept their drive alive and there's another, which means this Tennessee defense needs to step up soon or they're going to find themselves in overtime. That should have been picked. Smokey would have had the game in his hands, but his big nose got in the way of it. So the Demon Deacons have stayed alive for a little bit longer and they're picking up another first down. It really seems like this is going to be the first overtime game of the video, but those seven yards to reach the end zone are not guaranteed and Wake Forest didn't do it yet. They have two plays to pull it off and they refuse to run the ball. So it all comes down to this one fourth and goal and they went with the option. Now their quarterback's passing and it's caught. I have never seen this play run in NCAA football before, but I have to admit even it faked me out and Smokey has the ball first in overtime as they're going with a quarterback run, but they just took a brutal hit from the Demon Deacons and on third and eight, that is going to be intercepted. I have to admit making a play like this in a mascot suit is impressive and all the Demon Deacons have to do is kick a field goal to win this game, but they're passing and that was almost picked. I don't know what they were thinking, but in the end, they're going to kick the field goal for the win. So Tennessee Smokey has been eliminated and there are zero teams remaining in the state of Tennessee. I also enjoy seeing that my Kentucky Wildcats are still on there, but we'll see how far they go. And the Demon Deacons are having to play in back-to-back -back games with this one taking them straight to Clemson. We'll see if they have the stamina for back-to-backs. And they're up by six points with a minute and a half remaining, but the Tigers have the ball on their side of the field and they're looking to score a touchdown with this drive. Versus Tennessee, the Demon Deacons defense came up strong in the end, but now they're on the road here in Death Valley and Clemson just continues to run the ball with this one going all the way to the five-yard line. They've seemed to love this five wide formation as of recently and their quarterback just got it out. So they're very fortunate they didn't take a sack on that play because now they're about to score a touchdown. Evidently, the Tigers crossed the line, but now their defense can't give up a field goal to Wake Forest and they have 43 seconds. I'm a bit surprised the Demon Deacons aren't using one of their three timeouts right now. And for whatever reason, they felt the need to run it all the way down to the final seconds where they're gonna get stopped and Clemson's gonna get the win. The Tigers stay alive, at least for now, but there's still more than 70 teams remaining in mascot imperialism. So they got a long way to go if they're gonna win it all. All right, we're going right back to the wheel where this one will take us over to Northwestern. And they're the only team in the state of Illinois that has a mascot in NCAA football. So we'll see how they represent themselves. And Missouri's another one of the million teams that has a tiger for their mascot. Just like Clemson as well, they have the ball with a minute and a half remaining, trying to score a touchdown to take a lead. So we'll see if they can be successful in doing that. But they're finding themselves in a third and four where they are gonna get it out in time and that is not gonna get a first. On fourth and inches, I'm expecting the quarterback sneak. They have a guy in motion and they are not gonna go with the handoff. But luckily for them, they were able to hold on to that football and now they're taking a sack. It is third and 16. And on this play, they should probably take a deep shot, but they just went underneath. So to stay alive, they need 11 yards on fourth down and they're gonna come up short. Northwestern gets the exact result that they were looking for. And I'm impressed that they were able to hold on defensively to pull that one off. My Wildcats just got landed on though. So we have to play somebody. And of course it's us versus the Cardinals. We cannot lose this rivalry matchup, but I'm afraid it might happen as we have the ball on third and 11 and the Cardinals just sent an amazing blitz in. To get the ball back soon, we have to force a three and out and Louisville goes with the halfback screen and they just made it. So it's all gonna come down to these next few plays and we're gonna get the interception. You've never seen this happen before, but that is a one-handed catch with a Paul and Kentucky just snagged that to put us in a decent position where we should score. The only issue is if we don't pick up this third and seven, we're gonna have to tie it up with a field goal and that throw is intercepted too. So we are right back to where we were a minute ago and I don't think Louisville's gonna throw the ball again. It's gonna be painful to witness a loss to the Cardinals, but it's happening. And that first down sealed our fate in the end. My favorite team has already been put out, and because we just lost that game, we're gonna miss out on the mascot imperialism top 70. I didn't enjoy witnessing that, but now I'm just gonna root for as much chaos as possible, and the East Carolina Pirates just got landed on, with this arrow directing them straight to Duke. The Blue Devils have to defend their home territory, and if they pick up this third and four, they're gonna
going to be in a position where they could pretty much put it out of reach. They're going to do so as that falls into the end zone. And the Pirates are trying to score quick, but no matter what, they're going to have to recover an onside kick. So coming back is going to take a lot of different things going their way. And there's only about 30 seconds left because he just got tackled in bounds, which is going to happen again. The Blue Devils are not messing around. They have come out clamping up on defense, but it's time to see if they have a good hands team or not. And they do. They're going to stop the Pirates from stealing their land. And for whatever reason, I'm so proud of myself for coming up with that play on words. It really wasn't that clever, but let me know in the comments if you ended up catching it. And the Oregon Ducks have one of the most iconic mascots, but they might not survive this attack versus Cal. Ducks are much weaker than the Golden Bears, but with two minutes remaining, they have a seven point lead and the ball. So if they pick up one more first down, they could seal their win, but they're not going to. And if Cal drives down the field and scores a touchdown, we'll go to overtime. These Bears simply look way too friendly, and Oregon's mascot always reminds me of Donald Duck. I think that's what it was replicated as, and they get the interception. California couldn't defend their home territory, and somehow this is just the first result that we have had out west. Every other game has been on the other side of the United States or in the middle, and Baylor is the first team that's going to play from Texas, where they'll be headed up north to face the Mean Green. In-game North Texas's mascot looks like a duck, but just by taking a look at their midfield logo, I'd assume that it's representing some sort of bird, and they're beating Baylor by two possessions with 30 seconds left, which is insane. The Bears were not able to keep up, and I think this is the most points any team's won by, so North Texas might be an underdog team that could make a run, and we'll see what happens in the near future. Because every college is even in this mode, a 14-point win is like blowing somebody out, and this is the second time that the Badgers have had to play today, with this arrow forcing them into Northwestern. The winner of this battle should have the largest territory, and the Badgers have it in the Wildcats' red zone with a minute remaining, so they might run down the clock, because they can take the win with the field goal, and I think that's exactly what they're going to do. However, they weren't smart with the time as it's going to go to OT, and I cannot believe that they didn't take one of their timeouts and attempt a field goal, but they're going to get the interception. So once again, they have an opportunity to take three and get the win, but they throw an interception on the RPO, and I think the Northwestern Wildcats are going to take this back to the crib that is going to get them the win. All Wisconsin had to do was kick a field goal twice there, but they chose to be stubborn and not do it. So they deserve to lose all of this land. And as of now, the Wildcats have the largest territory. Wisconsin fans are not going to be happy about how that game just ended. And the wheel has landed on Rice, who we haven't seen play yet, but the Owls want to take their shot at beating Texas. The Longhorns mascot looks like that. And Hookham has struggled versus Sammy the Owl as they are losing by seven points with less than a minute remaining in this game. It's going to be hard to drive down the field with no timeouts, but at least they have an opportunity to tie it up if they move the ball well. And it's fourth and three, so they have to pick up at least a few yards, and they aren't able to. It was hard to tell from that angle, but this football was not held on to, and Rice just went into Texas and stole all of their land. The Longhorns have been knocked out from mascot imperialism, and that's another big school that we've seen exit very early on. We gotta keep it moving though, and next up on the list is the Tigers, who are traveling north to take on the Blazers. UAB's mascot is literally a dragon, and they have a three-point lead with around a minute and a half remaining, but they're going to have to light a fire on defense. Auburn is looking to go down the field and score the game-winning touchdown as they've completed back-to-back -back passes, and these teams have been going back and forth all day as they keep scoring touchdowns, but that's going to be an interception from UAB, and with one more first down, the Blazers can officially seal their win. They have to be one of the goofiest teams we've seen so far, but they're on a third and 14, so Auburn will probably get the ball back, and how did they just give up that run? That's going to officially ice the game for them, and that's going to leave just three teams remaining remaining in the state of Alabama. I liked how their mascot looked in game, so I'll probably end up rooting for the Blazers. And we all know at this point that Boston College has a cheat code spawn point, so they always do well in imperialism because they rarely get attacked and they get to claim a bunch of free land. We'll see if that carries the Eagles to the end of this video like it has in previous ones. And I love the Stanford Cardinal mascot in NCAA football, so I'm excited to see it take the field versus Fresno State because it's the goofiest looking mascot in the entire game. Physics-wise, the trees just look super weird going against most of the other opponents. And the craziest part about it is once they hand the ball off, you can't even see where it's at. That might be one of the reasons they destroyed Fresno State as they've won by 21, and that's easily the biggest win that we have seen so far, so the Cardinal could be primed for a deep run as well. I'm not sure if sim factors in physics or not, but they do have a size advantage, and the Gophers are next up with this arrow taking them to the northeast, and I guess the closest territory to that would be the Wildcats. So Northwestern already has to play for a third time, and they're in a lot of trouble as Minnesota has the ball with a couple minutes remaining, but the Gophers didn't learn 
from the Miami game as they're still running it, and they could have burnt through the rest of the clock with three knees, but they just got so lucky. Northwestern needed them to throw an incompletion to get the ball back, but because they tackled them in bounds, they're not going to. And with one win, the Gophers have the largest territory. Everything changes so quickly in imperialism, and we'll see how long Minnesota can hold on to all of this land for, but I think it could be a while because of where they're positioned on the map. Louisville now has to play for a second time after knocking out my Wildcats in their first game, and this time they're attacking Virginia Tech. We got two birds going at it here, and the Cardinals are up by one, but Virginia Tech is in field goal range, so realistically, they should just be running down the clock and kicking the game winner, but they want a touchdown, and I'm surprised that the computer was smart enough to call a timeout after that stop there. That's gonna give Louisville a chance to respond back, and they have 46 seconds and one timeout to get in field goal range, so I don't know why they're running. I gave the computer credit for being smart, but now they're not snapping the ball, and it took a false start for them to stop the clock. Now they find themselves in the same position they were 25 seconds ago, and this is gonna be a tackle inbounds, so they're probably gonna have one or two more plays, and they do still have that final timeout, but if this ball is gonna reach the end zone, their quarterback's gonna have to send it flying, and the Hokies didn't even give them a chance to let that happen. I'm glad that they've knocked out Kentucky's biggest rival, especially since they already put us out, and there's been a ton of chaos on the eastern side of the map compared to the western side. However, as I was saying that, the wheel landed on Boise State, and this arrow is simply going to get them more territory, so now the Broncos have twice the amount of land that they had, and this one's going to Oregon State. We've now had back-to-back -back spins land on teams out west, and the Beavers want to try and take all of the Broncos' land. Theoretically, Boise State should be one of the fastest teams in the game, but that hasn't meant very much because if they don't pick up this fourth and five, they're most likely not going to beat Oregon State, and the only way they still have a chance is if they're able to force a three and out on the Beavers. On second and five, the Broncos don't have many players in the box though, and that is going to seal the game. So all of this territory has now been taken from them, and Oregon State almost has as much as Minnesota now. Both of those teams have only played once, but they've put themselves in good positions. And if I'm remembering right, Marshall's mascot is the Green Herd, who have to go on the road at Virginia Tech. We'll see if the Hokies can defend their homeland again, and it seems like they will as Marshall's down by two possessions with a minute left. So even though they just picked up that fourth and one, they still have a long way to go, and they're not getting the first. By the time they'd score a touchdown, there's 19 seconds left, so they have to recover the onside kick, and they're not going to. The Hokies have picked up their second win, and they're doing so much better than their real football team would. They are surrounded by seven or eight other colleges, though, so they'll probably fall sometime soon, and Minnesota's back on the board already, this time headed down south. That means they have to play against Iowa State, and the Cyclones mascot is just another bird. It seems like they're gonna beat Minnesota, though, as they're about to go up by 10, and even if the Gophers do score here, they still have to recover an onside kick, so it's not looking too good for them, and here on third and nine, they're gonna throw it out of the back of the end zone. If they don't pick this up, it is all over, and Iowa State sent in a blitz. They're somehow still gonna get the throw out, though. It is caught, but he is marked short, so the Cyclones defense did a fantastic job, and Minnesota did not hold on to that territory for very long. Also, Iowa is now fully surrounded by their rivals, so if the wheel ever lands on them, they have no choice but to play Iowa State, and the Knights are back on the board for the second time today already as well. This one's directed them up towards Army, and their mass Scott is a black jack. Well, Army doesn't have a great shot of pulling this off, but with nine seconds left, they do have the football, and it seems like they're gonna have a shot at a Hail Mary, but at one point, they were down by 22 points, so I'm just impressed they got it all the way to here, and they couldn't even get the throw off. That's another win for the Scarlet Knights, and I'm pretty impressed with how they've done so far. Obviously, they're not guaranteed to make a run to the end, but they have a good spot, because they're all the way up in the northeast corner, and now West Virginia's headed up there. The arrow wheel wants them to face off against Pitt, and the Mountaineers have run into a pack of Panthers. They're losing the battle to them too, but they have the ball with about 40 seconds left and a chance to tie it up at 28, except they throw an interception immediately, and that is going to seal the game as it's taken to the five. Pitt withstood that little attack pretty well, and it seems like as of recently, we're starting to fly through some of these matchups. Not all the results have been that close, but the Panthers have to play again, and poor Rutgers does as well. Neither of these teams can catch a break, and this one's coming down to the wire, as Rutgers has the ball in the red zone down by eight with 40 seconds left. If they're able to score a touchdown, they're going to have to go for the two point conversion, but it's going to be fourth down, and since it's just inches, they could have picked it up with a quarterback sneak, but instead they're not going to make it. The Panthers' defense has clutched up twice in a row now, and it's a shame that the Scarlet Knights have been put out, but at least they had a good effort. Now for Ohio State, things are going to get interesting because they're going to play a bunch of max schools, but in mascot mode, it's an even matchup, so Zippy has a decent chance at knocking them out. However, this result looks like what it would be if the normal teams played, and I'm not sure why the Zips struggled so much, but they couldn't take down the Buckeyes. For having the home field advantage and all, that is a very disappointing result, but Akron winning there was just not meant to be, and now we're headed to Colorado. I hope that we get a matchup between Colorado State and the Buffaloes, but the Arrow wants to see the Rams play against Nebraska, and let's see if Herbie the Husker still leaves Nebraska fans disappointed. I'm not surprised that they're losing with a minute remaining, but if they have a good
good drive here. They could still tie it up at 35, and the Rams defense is going to have to step up, which is exactly what they just did on that play, and I don't know why the Cornhuskers are running. With limited time and only one timeout, you'd think that they'd pass it, but it's working for them as this one's going to go for another first, so I guess I just don't know what I'm talking about. Now they're scrambling again, and the Rams were definitely ready for this one. With only 19 seconds left now, you really have no choice but to pass it, and that ball is intercepted by Colorado State. The Rams have taken it away, and Nebraska is going to lose. At this point, Cornhusker fans are just used to it, and they've just lost their entire state to the Rams, who are now one of the 53 teams remaining in mascot imperialism. That was a close spin, but it just landed on South Alabama, and they're going up against Mississippi State. It's a battle between the Jaguars and the Bulldogs, and it's gone back and forth, but Mississippi State has a chance to take the lead. They're down by four, but if they get just 10 more yards, they're going to reach the Jaguars end zone, and Mississippi State just committed a dumb penalty. Due to a false start, it is now third and 13, and they're only going to get a couple, so it is fourth and long. They have to pick this up, and that throw is going to be knocked away. The Jaguars defense just clutched up, and even though they attacked an SEC school, they were able to leave with a win. We're just a few more rounds away from finding out who makes the top 50, and Washington, one of the few teams out west, is going to attack to the east. That means we're getting the Apple Cup in mascot mashup mode, and this should be a good one. However, the Cougars have struggled offensively as they've only scored once, and those tails look absolutely ridiculous on the screen as they're so long. When you can grab onto something like that, it's easy to make a bunch of tackles, and Washington State would need four straight scores if they want to come back against Washington, so there's almost zero chance of that happening, and that ball is going to seal it. The Huskies have taken over the entire state for themselves, and every team on this west side of the map is so spaced out, so I doubt we're going to see many more matchups over there, and this one is actually going to stay in the west. I was not expecting that, but the arrow spin's going to land us down to the southeast, and that just means Oregon gets more territory. Slowly but surely, all of the unclaimed states are starting to fill up, and the Jayhawks haven't had to play in mascot imperialism yet, but for their first game, they have to attack Iowa State. We got two birds battling it out in this one, and because of a couple missed extra points, Kansas is down by nine with about a minute and a half remaining, but they just scored a touchdown to get it within two, and they shouldn't have attempted the onside kick here. They have all three of their timeouts, so they could get the ball back either way if they get a stop, but that's looking less and less likely as Iowa State is only a couple yards away, and he breaks that tackle, which is going to get them the first down. However, he also got thrown out of bounds, so the Cyclones haven't won it yet, and Kansas is doing everything that they can to try and stop the run, so they've gotten it to a third and nine where they're trying to get the ball back, and they get the interception. This is why I stayed in and spectated the game. They can win. All they need is a field goal, and they have a minute and 18 seconds to go down the field. That's going to be 15, so the Cyclones have somehow found themselves in a position where they could lose this, and I can't believe it. The Jayhawks are flying down the field so far, and after missing that sack, they're going to get another first, and the Cyclones are being so aggressive, but they just can't stop them. The Jayhawks have done so well that they might end up scoring a little bit too quick on Iowa State, but they're being smart and running down the clock instead, and this one's going to go to the house. They left no room for error on a field goal attempt, and on the final play of the game, Iowa State doesn't get a throw out, so the Jayhawks just pulled off what seemed like the impossible, and with that result, they've taken over all of this land, which gives them the biggest territory with just 50 teams remaining. From what we've seen recently, there's no telling who's going to come out on top at the end, but the Utes just got landed on for the first time in this video, and they're being forced to take on BYU. It's a battle for the entire state, and this might be the highest scoring game that we have seen yet. The Cougars have it with 45 seconds left down in Utah's red zone trying to score a touchdown to tie it up, but they have to pick up this fourth and one to do so, and they don't. Now, unless they force a safety, they're going to lose to Utah, and Swoop has come through big time in the Holy War. They're going to knock off their rivals on the road and steal all of their territory in the process. The number of teams out west just continues to get thinner and thinner, and Colorado has a chance of being eliminated in this next one. They're going up against their in-state rivals as well, and we'll see if the Rams or the Buffaloes come out on top. I'm a bit surprised that with a minute and a half remaining, Colorado's trailing by 17, but their offense hasn't been able to get it done, and if they don't pick this up, it's all over. The Rams have now knocked both them out and Nebraska, so they're starting to build up a decent amount of territory, and now we're back over to the wheel where it's going to take us to Clemson. I thought the Rams were about to play for another game, but it stopped just short, and the Tigers are traveling up to Virginia Tech. It's another ACC battle for Clemson, and the Hokies are so good at defending their home territory as with about a minute remaining, they're up by two possessions. I don't know why, but it seems like no team can go in there and beat them, but Clemson has a chance if they recover the onside kick, and they're not able to. Virginia Tech seems to be a real threat, because as they successfully defend, they take over more and more land, so if I was a fan of one of the teams out in the east right now, I would want to avoid playing them. Western Kentucky could have to, though, if this arrow lands the right way, and it takes them in the other direction instead up north, which means it's the Hilltoppers versus the Boilermakers. Going into this one, they were the only team remaining in Kentucky, but there's no way that they can win, because they need to score two touchdowns 
touchdowns in eight seconds, and that simply isn't going to happen. There's the interception, and the Boilermakers just played a better game. They seem to be doing pretty well so far as they've taken out Western Kentucky and Cincinnati, but once you zoom out the map, they really don't have that much, and there's still plenty of teams remaining that would love to take their territory. Virginia could make things interesting if they're attacking Virginia Tech, but they've opted to pursue Maryland instead, and we'll see if they can knock out the Terrapins. Well, with about a minute left, they have a three-point lead, and they're not going to pick up this third down, but the fact that the Cavalier couldn't hold on to this ball is massive. The clock's not going to run, so Virginia only goes up by six, and I don't know why the scoreboard glitched out there, but it's 34-28, to and the Terrapins have a chance in this game still. They're a team of turtles, but they're going to have to pick up the pace if they want to reach the end zone, and the Cavaliers' defense has done a good job of just shutting them down as that sack is going to do it. Virginia has won their first game in imperialism, and to be completely honest, it's kind of weird seeing these Virginia schools have so much success. Most of the time, they just get knocked out very early on because they're not that good, but the Stanford trees are playing another game or just taking over more land as that arrow pointed them towards Hawaii. I wanted to see those goofy things run around for a second time, but I'm sure it'll happen later on, and Colorado State continues to have to play over and over, but they're going for the big shot against Oregon State. The winner of this game is going to control half of the Western United States, and with a minute and a half left, the Rams have the ball, but they're trailing by three, and it's going to be fourth down. They're being smart by saving all three of their timeouts just in case they don't pick this up, and that throw is going to be knocked away, so now they have to rely on their defense to force a three and out, but it seems like Oregon State is about to have the most land, and that should do it. The Beavers have knocked out the Rams, and that's going to cause a huge change to this map. The Beavers orange is all over it now, but Kansas's territory isn't much smaller than it, so there's a couple of big ones. Kansas State might be shooting for either of them too to knock one out, and Oregon State's about to face a lot of attacks, so we'll see if the Beavers Dam can keep intruders out. They're trailing by seven with 23 seconds left, but it seems like they're about to score, and the Wildcats defense is going to need to come up clutch, and why are they running the ball? That's not going to get a first. They have a timeout remaining, but they're not using it. They get the final snap off, and this throw is going to go short of the end zone, so the Beavers have lost at home to the Wildcats, and we're just continuing to witness more and more chaos. The two teams out of Kansas control the two biggest territories, and it would be awesome if they had to play each other in this next matchup, but that's not happening. Instead, it's Purdue that has to take the field for the third time, and of course it's the Jayhawks that are under attack. That's the problem with having one of the largest territories, and the Boilermakers have come to play as with 30 seconds left, they have a big lead over Kansas, and the Jayhawks are probably done. They need to find a way to rack up 15 points very quickly, and it's so weird seeing the Boilermakers have success in football, but why are they running the option? With no timeouts remaining, that play call made no sense, and the Boilermakers can celebrate for now, but they're about to be under constant attack. They're touching at least 13 different colleges now, so it's hard to imagine that they're going to last like that for the rest of the video, but I guess it is something that could happen, and Texas Tech is going north. This is the first time that they've played today, and we're about to see if a Raider can beat a Cowboy. It's been an interesting duel, but the Red Raiders have the last chance to pull it off, because if they score a touchdown on this drive, they would walk away as the winners if they hit the extra point, but they throw an interception straight to the Cowboys instead, and Oklahoma State's going to win this game. I was not expecting their drive to end that suddenly, but it's all over, and watching this one was so funny with both of them having massive hats. I'm glad that we've gotten another close result again, and Oklahoma State expands their territory by starting to conquer Texas. There's another four teams in the state still that they're going to have to knock out to take it all, but before we see what happens there, we're headed up to Toledo instead, and Purdue's territory is so massive, this is an attack on them. The Rockets of all teams could be the biggest one, but Pistol Pete and the Boilermakers steamrolled Toledo, winning 56-7. to We've yet to see this big of a mismatch, and I'm kind of shocked that Toledo just got beaten that badly, but the Boilermakers made a statement with that win. They showed the whole country that they're not going to mess around when you attack them, and it's time to see where the Tigers are heading out of Louisiana. It seems like they're heading straight up to Arkansas, and I wonder if they're going to feast on the Razorbacks' defense. Well, that's actually exactly what happened, as Arkansas is trailing by 18 with a minute remaining, and if they want to come back, they're going to have to score very soon, but they've struggled with grasping onto balls all day, and when you're down by 18 points, there's not much you can do. I mean, it would definitely help if they could catch something, but they are going to get in on fourth and goal, and just in case something fluky happens, we have to keep spectating as they recover the onside kick. That's led to them driving down the field and getting it to the five yard line where this time they almost throw a pick. But even if they do get in, they're going to have to get another onside kick recovery. And you're only going to get lucky once most likely in a game. But we will see what happens on this play and the Tigers actually recovered this football. LSU was able to hold on in the end, but we almost witnessed an incredible comeback and I don't regret staying in the game that long. If they would have pulled it off, it would have been wild. But now we're going back to the wheel and it's landing on Ohio. So I think this is the first time that the Bobcats are going to play and they're headed straight to Pitt. If a Panthers considered a cat, we got two different cats going.
going at it. And Ohio has the ball down by five with about 30 seconds remaining. So there's a chance that they knock out the Panthers, but they're going to have to start moving it quick and that's intercepted instead. Ohio just wasn't able to pull it off. And this result barely adds anything to Pitt's territory. I'm sure they're thankful for it though, because it does seem like the smaller, the better it is. And Duke is going for expansion with an attack to the Northwest. So Virginia Tech has to defend again. They've been very successful at doing this. And I don't know what it is, but they continue to pull it off. This is like the fifth time they've beaten a team by two possessions. And at some point, teams have got to learn to just avoid playing the Hokies. They are running through colleges left and right. And next up is Oklahoma State again. So we'll see what the Cowboys can do in their third game that they've played. And instead of taking more of Texas, they want all of Arkansas and Louisiana. They're going to have to play their best to beat the Tigers at Death Valley. But before we see who wins that, a word from today's video sponsor, Prize Picks. With football going on, this is the best time to get the app and you can play in over 30 states, so there's a good chance yours is eligible. Anyway, you're probably wondering what Prize Picks is, and on there you simply pick two to six players and higher or lower on their projections. But what's so neat about it is you can win up to 25 times the money if you're right, but you could also go with smaller entries like these, which still pay out well. If you want some free cash to get started with on Prize Picks, code border, the first link in my description will double your initial deposit up to $100. Now we'll see if Oklahoma State can keep up with LSU. And they tried their best, but they haven't been able to keep up offensively. Eventually, the Tigers would score a touchdown, and on this fourth and six, they are going to pick it up, but they need to somehow get 14 points in less than a minute, and that simply isn't going to happen. I wanted Oklahoma State to do better, but in the end, they just didn't run the right plays, and their little cowboy hats aren't going to make it on to the next round unless they score a touchdown on fourth and 13. I guess not all hope is lost just yet, but they aren't going to get the onside kick, so that will officially seal the game. And with that result, there's a wall of purple surrounding all of Texas, plus a good amount of it up north as well. At this point, there's only 36 colleges remaining, so we are past the halfway mark. And congratulations if your team is still in it, but there's a bit more to go. For example, South Carolina and NC State haven't had to play yet, but now the Gamecocks are getting thrown into a matchup against the Wolfpack. And with a minute and a half remaining, South Carolina has the ball, but they're trailing by eight and wasting a down. So all of a sudden, it's third and 18 from their own 10, and this ball is gonna be caught. I did not think that they were gonna get out of that situation, but maybe they'll still march it down the field. And Cocky is getting run through back there, so he just needs to have a little bit more time if they're gonna be successful. But now it's fourth and 13 where they have to pick it up and they don't make it. The Wolf Pack held strong against South Carolina and they're gonna take all of their territory. It's not that much, but it doubles theirs by size. And they've just coasted along by not having to play until this point in imperialism. But now Rice is stuck going into their second matchup and they're headed up to North Texas. I'd imagine an owl would have a hard time beating an eagle, but they destroyed them going into their home stadium and winning 38 to seven. It feels impossible to predict who's gonna come out on top of these matchups. And I feel like so many random things have already happened, but I'm sure there's going to be even more. My town's team USF has avoided having to play so far, but now we're stuck facing the Gators and the Bulls have a tough one going into the swamp. However, with about two minutes remaining, it is tied up at 24. And I don't know why I find it so funny. The Gators have these little hats on top of them. After stopping USF on that third down though, they got a punt return to the 30 and Florida's in a good position. So the Bulls are going to need to clutch up and get a defensive stop sometime soon. And they have an opportunity to do it here on third and five as the pressure is about to get in, but the throw got out and he's out of bounds. Florida's going to go up by three, but at least USF still has a chance. And with all three timeouts remaining as well, I could think of worse situations, but that was a very rough sack to take. And why are we running the ball? It's now third and 16 and we've gone backwards six yards. This ball is going to be tipped and intercepted by the Gators. He caught it. And after he failed to come down with it with his hands, it looks like he just snatched it with his mouth. It's unfortunate, but USF has been knocked out and the Gators are going to be a tough team for any other college to knock out. I feel bad for Kansas State because not only do they have some of the most territory and the wheel is still landing on them, but they just got blessed because that arrow simply pointed them to more land. They've avoided having to play at least for now. And now we're headed back to Virginia where the Cavaliers did win one game against the Terrapins, but now they're trying to beat Pitt as well. And the Panthers have done a good job of winning at home. The Cavaliers must have done something right though, because as time runs down, they're running out the clock and they have a 10 point lead on Pitt. These Virginia schools have been a different breed in mascot imperialism. And if they continue to stay alive, they're going to take over the entire East Coast. I also just noticed that Boston College is still in it, so that is no surprise. But the wheel has landed on Syracuse, who is a team that's close to them. And of course, this arrow is directed towards Virginia. The Orange have yet to face off against anybody. And they're another one of the funniest looking mascots. But it seems like they're about to lose to Virginia as they're down by five points. And they have a long way to go to get down the field. But if they can pull off the 95-yard drive to knock out the Cavaliers, they definitely deserve it. And that first down is going to move the chains to keep their comeback hopes alive, but they cannot check it down because they have one timeout remaining and this is another short pass that's going for a 
tackle inbounds. Their bad clock management is most likely going to cost them, but they do pick up this first down and get to about the 30. So we'll see what they can do. They most likely have like one or two plays left. And I have a feeling that on the Hail Mary, it's going to be hard for an orange to come down with a 50-50 ball. They're much shorter, but this ball is placed in a good spot and the Cavaliers just made a better play on it. I'm telling you, these Virginia schools are simply not losing. And I don't know why that is. They have had so much success in this video. Poor Purdue just got landed on as well though, and they have so much territory. So we'll see if they can withstand it versus the Irish. They're literally facing off against a bunch of leprechauns, but in game, they're a little bit bigger and that's led to a very close matchup. With a little under two minutes remaining, Notre Dame is down by four points, but they continue to slowly drive it down the Boilermakers defense and this halfback screen gets them another five. There's 56 seconds left now, but that's plenty of time to get 25 yards. And if Notre Dame gets any closer to the end zone, Purdue might have to start taking some of their three timeouts. This ball's gonna almost be picked and the Boilermakers could have ended it right there, but the Leprechauns have the luck on their side and this one didn't work out. Third and 14 now, and this most likely has to be a big play for Notre Dame, which it is. So this is a fourth and one that's very manageable, but they go with the pass and it's not gonna make it. There was simply a bit of a size disadvantage over here in the end zone, and Purdue continues to win games. It's not been easy for them to stay alive in imperialism, but their efforts have gotten them a spot in the top 30, and almost half of these teams still haven't had to play a single college. The Eagles, Boston College, is a perfect example of that, but now they have been placed against Virginia, and they could swoop in and steal all of the Cavaliers' hard work. However, in order to do that, their defense is going to need to hold strong and keep the Cavaliers to a field goal, and that's a real possibility since it's third and nine and Virginia just handed it off. That means Boston College is only falling behind by six, and the Eagles need one good offensive drive, but they have struggled all day as they've only put up 14 points. Something about this Cavalier defense has been hard for almost every single team to crack, and on this next play, that sack was instant. Virginia has been generating some solid pressure, and the Eagles are going to be stuck on fourth down, it seems, but because their running back fought so hard to make sure that he got the first down, they're able to move the chains, and on this next play, Virginia sent a bit of a blitz, but Boston College was ready for it, as that's another first. The Eagles are starting to get into a bit of a rhythm, but there's only about 30 seconds left and they're down to the 25. The Cavaliers run could end right here if their defense doesn't step up and they don't. They've done so well to get to this point, but unless they miraculously make it to field goal range in 21 seconds, it is all over and they should probably start taking some deeper shots down the field, but they aren't. It's honestly kind of sad to see the Cavaliers go out because they have done such a fantastic job, but they could still pick up 10 yards in the next six seconds and go for the field goal, except instead they're going deep for the Hail Mary and that is going to be intercepted. The Eagles have come in and knocked out the Cavaliers. So like always, Boston College has success in imperialism, but they might have just expanded a bit too early on because now they're a lot more vulnerable to being attacked. And I'm very interested to see how this plays out in the next 29 rounds. Miami down at the bottom of Florida can only go up north. So no matter where that arrow landed, they were going to play Florida. And this matchup decides who controls the entire state. At one point, the Hurricanes were up 35 to 14, but now it's all tied at 35. And they have the ball at midfield, but if they can't get in field goal range, they're in trouble. All of the momentum in this game has swung in the Gators' favor, and they have the home field advantage, so Sebastian being able to reel in this catch and keep it in his hands is incredible. I would assume that that puts them in field goal range, but I don't know how good their kicker is, and there's not much the Gators can do unless they force an interception or a fumble, because Miami is starting to get the ball rolling. Even after blowing a 21-point lead, they're gonna knock out the Gators, and the Hurricanes are definitely happy with this result. I think this is the first time that they've won the state in any of the imperialisms I've done, but something seems to always go wrong with Miami, so I'm sure they'll find a way to ruin it. It took a while, but the Crimson Tide are finally gonna have to go into a matchup, and their first game is gonna be at the Blazers. This is the team that knocked out Auburn early on, and if they can finish this drive off, they're gonna take a lead over Alabama with a couple minutes left. Elephants are super strong though, so I'm expecting them to hold their line, and UAB has not been able to run the ball all day, so they're passing on third and goal, but it's a missed throw. If he would've hit his target here, they'd be going up by three points, but now it's fourth and goal from the nine yard line, and they mixed in a halfback screen which was terrible. Alabama was ready for that from the start, and unless UAB can force a three and out, Alabama's gonna win. It's definitely been a defensive type of game though, and the Blazers are stacking the box, so they're gonna shoot in those holes, which makes it third and 12 for the Crimson Tide, where they're gonna throw it, and that is gonna be almost picked. They're very fortunate that the Dragons don't have good hands to catch the ball with, because they have to start their drive back here instead, and it's not going well. There's only a minute remaining, and they still need to move down half the field, so they have gotta start getting some big gains, and that pass makes this a fourth and manage where they're going to go with the quarterback run up the middle and that was very risky. Nobody in the stadium was expecting a quarterback draw and that's why it worked as he is going to escape again. But with only one timeout remaining, they've got to go away from the run and he is slinging it deep where the elephant's going to knock it
it away. And it looks like he made that play with his trunk. Will UAB pick up this fourth and four? No way. And I don't know why they ran it there. Alabama's gonna go into their stadium and take all of their land. So even in mascot mashup, the Crimson Tide are having success. And what's it gonna take for Alabama to be bad at something again? I'm not sure, but I just realized Georgia's still in this as well. And in their first game, they won a piece of Miami. The Bulldogs are being aggressive right out the gate, but it's not gonna work out for them as the Hurricanes had control of this game the entire time. They're gonna move on with another win, and Georgia just got put out with relative ease. Now, if your team survives this next round, they're gonna make the top 25, but Alabama is up again, and this time they're headed up north. They went from not playing to wanting a piece of Purdue, and this is a ballsy call, but they could steal a ton of territory. They have a six-point lead with a minute remaining, but their defense is gonna have to come up strong for them, and since they just did that against the Blazers, I wouldn't be surprised if they did it against the Boilermakers. In this matchup, Purdue is a very undersized opponent, but they are getting this first down past midfield, and they still have 32 seconds left, but they cannot take a sack because they have no timeouts remaining, and that was a bad throw. They've thrown it 51 times tonight, so they've completely avoided the run, and I can't blame them, but they have to figure out something that's gonna work, and this is gonna be a terrible wide receiver screen where they take a sack. I've seen that happen time and time again, and they don't even get the ball out on fourth down, so Alabama's gonna knock out Purdue, and even though they just started playing their matchups a few rounds ago, they're now one of the biggest colleges with just 25 teams remaining. It's kind of wild that there's still 10 or 11 teams that have yet to play in a game, and Arizona State is one of them, but they can't avoid it for any longer. They've been forced to travel up to Utah, and we'll see what the Sun Devils can do. They've played well, but with about a minute remaining, they have to hold on to their seven-point lead versus the Utes, and Utah's gonna have to start going a bit deeper, but instead they run the ball. Now they only have one timeout remaining, and it seems like they're just gonna go underneath, so it all comes down to this, where Arizona State sent in a blitz, and Utah went deep with it instead, which actually worked out for them. I thought Sparky might pick this ball off, but he's just a bit too short, and depending how this goes, we might be headed to overtime. They're going deep with it for the second time, and it doesn't work again. With one interception, Arizona State takes all of Utah, and they've begun their expansion out here in the West, but they're doing it at the right time because there's not that many colleges remaining. The wheel wants to see Washington play again, so that's what we're gonna get, and no matter where the arrow pointed, they're surrounded by Kansas State. The Huskies are trying to take all of the Wildcats' land, and they're super close to pulling it off as they have a six-point lead with about a minute left. Their defense is gonna have to hold strong one final time, though, and they get the sack, so it's third and 17 for Kansas State, and they're going with a deep pass that gets open. Now they're out there on five wide, and I'm gonna assume that they're gonna keep slinging it down the field as this one goes for another 20, and the Huskies' defense is starting to get gashed by this Wildcats quarterback as he's going for another 20-yard completion. That's three straight plays where they've had some extremely large gains, and after spiking it, it is third and two where there's somebody open in the flat, so they're gonna get the first, and the Huskies better figure it out because Kansas State can win this game with an extra point after a touchdown. That tackle and bounce makes a big difference, though, because they had to waste time and a down spiking it, but they can't guard the slant, and that was an incredible catch. No matter what happened here, the Wildcats receiver wasn't dropping the ball, and all that's left on the clock is six seconds, so they can just heave up a prayer and hope this goes well for them, but it's not going to. Kansas State holds on to their large territory, and with just 23 colleges left now, they're picking up a little more land, making them about the same size as Alabama is. Now we are back to the wheel, and it's going to take us to North Carolina, so the Tar Heels are finally going to have to play in their first matchup, and of course it's versus their in-state rivals. We'll see if the Wolfpack can stop Ramuses, and they could not as the Tar Heels have doubled their score and they're still running it up. The little amount of land that they had has now been taken over, and with another spin we are headed to Alabama or Arizona. I thought the Crimson Tide were about to be forced to play again, but instead the wheel gifts the Wildcats some free territory, and they haven't had to do anything in imperialism so far, but neither has Air Force who is now finally being forced to play. Ironically enough, it's against Arizona, so the Falcons are going on the attack, and it's been a pretty low scoring game with it all tied up at 14. Air Force is threatening to score though, and they're just gonna go with the dump off, which is gonna be short, so that means that the Falcons are settling for a field goal, and they're trusting their defense versus the Wildcats, who have an interesting hat on their head. That is a big sack on the first play, but they only sent four on the next one, so Arizona had enough time, and on third and four, with 37 seconds remaining, they are going to just take the drag underneath, but the Falcons swarm that ball, so it is fourth and four, where they are going to send in a lot of players, and they just couldn't get any pressure in in time. All it takes for Arizona to tie it up is a field goal, so they don't need much, but they might be going for the touchdown as they're down to the seven, and all of a sudden, the Falcons find themselves in a position they don't want to be in. After getting that sack there, though, Arizona has to take their three, and they'd score on their first drive in overtime, putting all of the pressure on the Falcons quarterback who can't get it out. It is fourth and long for Air Force, where they're just going to go with the flat underneath, and the Falcon is fighting, but not enough, so they're going to lose in overtime, and just like their rivals Arizona State did a second ago, Arizona wins their first game. That result also means that the only military school remaining
maintaining his navy. And after not being landed on all day, North Carolina has been again. They're going to challenge the Hokies on the road. And Virginia Tech's been amazing at defending their land. But I guess their run is going to end here because they're down by 25. And they have more total yards than the Tar Heels, but they're still going to lose. That's the difference when you finish offensive drives versus when you don't. And it's a shame that they're getting put out in embarrassment after all that they've gone through. But it was time for the East Coast to look a lot different. And neither of the Virginia schools were able to make the cut to the top 20. Houston's an interesting team for it to land on because they haven't played. And they're trying to steal a chunk of Texas from Rice. I doubt the Owls want to lose this rivalry matchup though. So it's no surprise that they have a nine point lead on the Cougars with a minute remaining. And by the time they're kicking this field goal, there's almost no time left. They've defended their home territory pretty well. And they're just one of the two Texas teams remaining in mascot imperialism. Between them and TCU, that's all that the state has left. And North Carolina cannot avoid being landed on. Only them or the Hurricanes are going to survive this one. And they have both done so well to make it this far. But only one team is going to survive this one. And it could be either of them as North Carolina is about to score a touchdown. And with a two point conversion, they could tie it up at 33, but they're not going to. That means their defense is going to have to figure out how to stop Sebastian and the Hurricanes, but they've already forced them into a second and 15, so Miami isn't even trying to run the ball, and it seems like North Carolina is about to get it back with a chance to win. All they need is a field goal, which shouldn't be too difficult, and why are they spiking it with two minutes left? There was so much time on the clock, and they just wasted it down. I've never seen the computer do that before, but they're not picking this up, and that was probably one of the worst decisions I've ever seen. I can't believe they spiked it, but they're not going to win, because in the end, the Hurricanes defense came up clutch, and with a win like that, they're going to take over a lot more land. It's probably like the 7th or 8th largest territory though, so they still have a lot of work to do, and this wheel is taking us back to South Alabama. It feels like it's been forever since they last took the field, but they're going to have a chance to be the final team remaining in their state, and all they have to do is beat the Crimson Tide. I don't think that's going to happen though, considering they've only scored 6 points on Alabama until this play, and they have a big comeback that they need to make, but they're not going to get the onside kick, so Big Al keeps his spot in imperialism, and to Alabama, adding on this much territory is almost nothing because they have so much up here from their win over Purdue. Almost all the teams that won a lot early on have now been eliminated, and I'm almost certain that UCLA hasn't had to play a game yet, so we'll see what they do in their first one versus the Sun Devils. The Bruins are going to have to play well on the road, and that's what they've done as with 13 seconds left, the Sun Devils are trailing by 10, so there's almost nothing they can do, and I would give away like 20 jerseys if they were able to pull off a 10-point comeback in the span of 9 seconds. That would have definitely been a sight to see, but of course that was never going to happen, and we are starting to fly through some of these matchups, but the Hawkeyes are another team that has yet to have to play, and they have no choice but to face Alabama. I wonder if their mascot team's going to have an actual offense, and they kind of have since they have 21, which is a lot more than usual, but they need another 7 to win this game, and that's a big play. I am not used to seeing the Hawkeyes have explosive offense like this, but they still have a lot to go to get to the end zone, and with 21 seconds remaining, they can't afford to take a sack. This one's going towards the end zone, but it's not going to be caught, and I swear the size of the elephants just makes everything so difficult. They're able to get to everything, and on 4th and 5, they don't get a throw away, so the Hawkeyes are going to fall short to the Crimson Tide. And I don't get why Alabama has to be so good in mascot mode, but they're definitely the biggest college with 15 teams remaining. Since all the teams are even, though, I feel like they're due to lose if they keep getting in matchups, and we keep landing on colleges that haven't played yet. Georgia Tech avoided it all up to this point, but now the Yellow Jackets have a tough task ahead of them, and if their defense can hang on with a minute remaining, they are going to pull it off. They gotta stop Alabama, though, who has the ball right now. And I'm impressed with the fact that they have a seven-point lead on the Crimson Tide. Big Al is dropping back and trying to scramble, but the Yellow Jackets were all over that, and now they're just gonna get a few. Third and 11, Big Al is going to step back and throw it over the middle for the first down. And it seems like overtime could be a possibility if Alabama is able to score a touchdown. And to be honest, since they have such a size advantage on the Yellow Jackets, I am expecting them to do so. That's a tackle in bounds, though. And the Crimson Tide didn't want to waste their final timeout, so there's only 12 seconds remaining, and that's a bad throw. It is 4th and 11, and it all comes down to this, where they went with a halfback screen, but Big Al didn't even get the throw out there, and the Yellow Jackets are now the biggest territory. They have only played one game, but that is going to change everything, and the map of the United States just keeps switching up. It's basically a coin toss between every single one of these teams remaining, and Bowling Green is another small college that could shock the world. Speaking of shock as well, they're playing against Georgia Tech, and the Falcons could steal all of their new territory. The only issue is they're trailing by 7 with a minute left, and they take a sack there, so the odds of them pulling it off are not good, and they're on a third and 19 where they have to go with something deep down the field, but they don't get the ball out, and they fumbled it away. Who picked it up? I can't tell. There was literally just a swarm of mascots in this pile where you can never see the ball, but apparently Bowling Green has it, and this is fourth and 11. The scoreboard is blurred out, but because that pass was short of the marker, they're not going to win, and that result does almost nothing for Georgia Tech. All they did was pick up the tiniest little piece of land.
land right there, and Boston College isn't gonna avoid playing for any longer, or maybe they will because the arrow loves them. I swear they always make it to the end, and I still need to do an imperialism with every college's random location, but I should probably finish this one first before I plan out the next one, and this is between the final two teams in Texas. Rice has done so well to continue to stay alive, and it's all tied up with a minute and a half remaining, but the Owls have the ball driving on the Horn Frogs, so they're looking to take a lead here, but they might as well just run out the clock and settle for a field goal. It's kind of hard to believe, but TCU isn't taking any timeouts, and on third and five, Rice just goes with another handoff, so they're gonna settle for three to get the lead, and unless the Horn Frogs cook up something crazy here, they're gonna be eliminated. They didn't even have a chance to get that ball out, but they do have one final heave, and they're also not gonna get it out, so they're gonna lose to Rice, and the Owls pounced all over that opportunity. If there's any underdog teams remaining, it is them and Navy, because they're the only mascots remaining from smaller conferences, and Arizona's one of the final teams out west, where they're trying to steal some territory from UCLA. After this year, this will no longer be a Pac-12 matchup, so I was hoping this one would come down to the wire, and it has as Arizona has the ball on third and goal on UCLA's 10, but the Bruins just got a massive interception, and the Wildcats are gonna need a miracle to stay in this one, as they have two timeouts. All the Bruins have to do is run the ball three straight times, and if they were smart, they would punt the ball out of bounds on fourth down, but I don't think they're going to. So for the first time in an imperialism, it is going to end with a punt return, and don't tell me they're gonna fair catch it. All right, they're at least gonna attempt it, but the Bruins literally lit the Wildcat up. They clearly wanted to win a little bit more than Arizona did, and if your team survives this round, they're gonna make the top 10, but Georgia Tech just continues to wanna play in games, and that arrow is gonna take them over to LSU's land. The Yellow Jackets are headed into Death Valley, and they have a lead with 52 seconds remaining, but it's all gonna come down to how their defense does. LSU has reached their red zone, and it's probably gonna sting for Georgia Tech fans if they're not able to hold on to their lead here, but the Yellow Jackets have forced it to a fourth and two, and they were not ready for the option run at all. LSU doesn't need to be in a hurry or spike the ball, but they did the one thing they couldn't, getting a false start, and now they're gonna have to snap this ball from the six yard line, which is a bit farther away. Then they're gonna waste second and goal spiking it, so they only have two more attempts to make it in, and they're not doing it here. That was instant pressure from Georgia Tech. It is fourth and goal, and they are not going to get the throw out, so the Tigers just got swarmed, and Georgia Tech fans have to be buzzing right now, because that win actually gets them a large sum of territory, and with just 10 colleges left, they have been dominating. We only have nine matchups remaining, and the wheel is taking us to Ohio State, so it's been a long time since the Buckeyes last played, but they're up, and if anything, this arrow points towards Boston College. We'll see if the Eagles can defend their home territory, and they're trying their best, but it's not enough. They just took a bad sack, and now it is third and 13, where they go with a little bit of a play action. The Eagle has plenty of time back there. The Buckeyes couldn't get anything in, and that's gonna go for a first down plus more. I thought Boston College was about to be done because they're down by five, but now they're starting to move it, and they're at midfield already. This time on third and two, they're gonna convert it. So Brutus, the Buckeye, is gonna have to generate some pressure, and the Eagles are going deep, which is gonna get them inside the five, or the end zone. They just broke a tackle. What an amazing drive from Boston College, but because they didn't get the two-point conversion, they can lose with a field goal, and I don't know why Ohio State's not taking a timeout, but evidently they don't wanna win as they've taken it down to just one second remaining, and that is not gonna go to the house. The Eagles have survived for the time being, and just like we predicted, they've taken over most of the Northeast, but Navy's a sneaky team in here because they haven't been picked yet, and they continue to avoid being landed on, so they haven't had to play. Kansas State and Georgia Tech is a different story though, because both of these colleges have gone through a ton, but the Wildcats have failed to keep up all day, and I think it's too late to make a comeback. With about 30 seconds left, they were down by three possessions, and Georgia Tech recovers the onside kick, so the Yellow Jackets continue to defend their territory, and compared to every other college on the map, they have so much land. With only eight teams remaining, there's a decent chance that they're able to hold on to it as well, but Oregon could be gunning for it if this arrow goes in the right direction, and that's exactly what's going to happen. We'll see if the Ducks can do what the Wildcats couldn't, and I don't understand how the Yellow Jackets keep getting away with this. Once again, they're up by a couple possessions as time runs out, and it seems like nobody's able to take them down. They've had luck on their side throughout this entire video, and every single team on the map besides Navy touches their territory. That's why it would not surprise me if they're a part of this next matchup as well, and with this wheel spin, the arrow is going to take Boston College down south. It's a very tight call, but they're going to avoid the coast of Navy and hit this part of Miami's, so we're getting a rivalry matchup with just a few teams left, and the Hurricanes have done their best, but they're still down by eight with about a minute left, so they have to finish off this drive, and they're also going to need the two-point conversion, so they have no room for error, and taking a sack in that situation to make it third and nine is just very unlucky. Now it's fourth down, so they have to pick this up, and they went with the Shakes concept, but their quarterback tried to scramble, and Sebastian just wasn't able to make it to the first down marker, so Boston College is going to go into Miami and take all of their land, and although their starting point might have carried them for a while, they are playing very well. They actually deserve
deserve to be here in the top six. They've won a ton of games and they continue to get landed on with this one taking them up north. So at least for now, they get to avoid playing again, but I'm sure it's coming for them. They've had to be in a ton of different matchups. This one goes to UCLA and with this wheel spin, they are going to attack up near where Stanford is. It's a battle between the final teams in California and there's that hideous tree mascot. You might think their ridiculous size would carry them to victory, but they're losing to UCLA and with no timeouts left, they're going to have to spike this ball, but it took them a while. They're going to need to just send up a prayer and hope for the best with this throw not getting out yet. They might send it deep. Instead, it's another sack and it is now fourth and 24 for the trees with about 10 seconds left. So it seems like it's all over and this throw is going to get them the first down or not. Considering they don't have any hands, it shouldn't be any surprise that they drop this football and the Bruins have made the top five. That's a very solid road win for them. And I was rooting for Stanford just because of how stupid their mascot looks, but they've now been eliminated and this is all we have left. Unless this wheel spin lands on Navy, it's going to be Georgia Tech playing no matter what, because there's no way for this wheel to point towards any other college. And these two opponents are so far spaced out. The Yellow Jackets have done a fantastic job about winning at home, but if their defense can't stop UCLA from going 75 yards down the field, they're going to lose. Luckily for them though, the Bruins are committing false starts. So after they picked up seven yards on that first play, they really only got two. And after taking a sack there, it is third and 11 where they are going to go deep and they were not prepared for it. If you're a Georgia Tech fan, that's got to sting, but there's 37 seconds left. So your defense could still get a stop. And I can't believe they couldn't hold on to that ball. It would have all been over right there. But now if their defense gives it up, they know that they choked in that situation. And the UCLA receiver should have had more awareness there to just run out of bounds. He's going to get it again. And this time he does the same thing. I mean, the clock stops on first downs, but if they're not going to hike it, they're going to burn through at least a few seconds. And this pass is going to go back to him for only a few. So it's going to come down to one final play with no time left and it's intercepted instead. The Yellow Jackets finally had a game that they cut close, but in the end they came up clutch and that means they're going to have like 75% of the US. There's only three other teams remaining that could stop them from winning at all and Navy is finally being forced into playing a game, so we will see how they do. Even though they're the midshipmen, they have Billy the Goat as their mascot and it's at Boston College, so I'm impressed that they're still in it as it's now third and four and they're only trailing by six points, but that's going to be intercepted and if they're not able to force a three and out, it is all over. They had an opportunity to have a game-winning drive down the field, but instead they're going to fall short to the Eagles. And to be completely fair, they would have not deserved to win that one. To get to this final three, Boston College has actually had to go through a lot, and it seems like Rice is going to automatically make the championship, but because of where the arrow points, the closest land is Maine, so we have to head back to the wheel, and this time it lands on the Owls. I honestly feel bad for them, but they have to play in this next game now, and Boston College is who automatically makes the championship. These two mascots will be competing for the other spot, and with two and a half minutes remaining, Georgia Tech finds themselves down by 10. They're not out of it yet because they still have three timeouts, but they're going to have to score at least a field goal on this drive, and on third and five, they're going to pick it up. They've done so well at home, but the Owls have outplayed them today, and on this first and goal, they're going to go over the middle, which does result in Buzz catching a touchdown, but now they're going to need to find a way to get the ball back, and the onside kick was not it. If they run commit three straight times, they will have a chance, and why is Rice passing the ball? If that was an incompletion, that would have made almost no sense, but now it's third down, and we'll see what they cook up here. They are going with the pass, and they're not going to get the ball out. The Yellow Jackets have forced them to punt it back to them, and this one is going out of the back of the end zone, so they've done exactly what they needed to if they wanted to stay in this game, and now they have to take advantage of it with a deep shot, which is going to result in an interception almost immediately. The Owls are going on to the national championship, and Georgia Tech did all of that to just fall short. When I started recording, I would have never predicted this combination, but here we are at the final wheel spin where Rice is the attacker, and I don't even know why I'm spinning this wheel because we know what's happening. It's going to be the Owls versus the Eagles, and it's time to see who the best mascot is in NCAA football. It's a battle between two birds, and on the Eagles' first drive, they are not going to hold on to that. So even though it's early on, this could end up being a very costly drop because they're being forced to settle for just three. Now Rice has worked it down the field on them, and they went with a little bit of a play action here. So the Owls have gotten it down to the four-yard line, but that might not be enough. If they're not able to pick this up, they're also going to have to go for just a field goal, and they're not going to. So the Eagles defense is pumped up because they've kept it all tied up at three. I didn't think that we were going to get a defensive battle, but that's what it's been so far. And the Owls just got another stop and that's led to them driving all the way down the field, but throwing an interception on the goal line. What a game changing play by the Eagles to get that ball. And they're trying to end the first half in the best way possible. I cannot believe that Rice turned it over in that situation, but now they need to get a stop and they're struggling to do it. So it seems like the Eagles are about to score the first touchdown of the game, but with only one timeout remaining, they've been in hurry up mode and they're 
panicking, which isn't going well. If the Owls can stop them from going five yards here, that's going to be the stop they need, but they weren't ready. And I can't believe they weren't expecting the quarterback run because that's all the Eagles did there. But after giving up a field goal, Rice finds themselves down by 10. And even though it's almost the end of the third quarter, they still haven't scored a touchdown. So they really need to punch this one in. They're going with the pass and it's knocked away. It's hard to believe that they're only attempting a field goal here, but they thought they could lean on their defense and we'll see if it pays off on third and three, which it does. They forced the stop that they wanted, but the Eagles have a good field goal kicker as this goes down the middle. So they're trailing by two possessions and they're going to need their offense to come alive at some point. But that was another bad throw as it's picked. I cannot believe that they just turned it over in that situation. But it seems like Boston College is finally going to win their first imperialism. And it's all because of their defense since their offense has been pretty rough. Rice's only chance is to maybe get a stop here, but they're not able to do it. So the Eagles have officially won mascot imperialism. And that was an incredible win from them as they were able to take over almost the entire United States. That's going to wrap it all up though. And if you enjoy imperialism, I'd recommend checking out this playlist, but make sure you leave a like on this video.